All right. Good to see you this evening. Welcome to the midweek service. And uh, boy, it feels like about September 22nd, doesn't it? And uh, we'll take it. All right. It's going to warm back up again, I'm sure. But uh, it's beautiful out tonight, isn't it? All right. Take your Bible this evening, if you would. Let's go to John chapter 12. We are on the last disciple. And last because he's always mentioned last. Uh, and rightfully so. It is Judas Iscariot. And John chapter 12 is where we'll <clears throat> begin tonight, but we'll be turning to a lot of different scriptures uh, this evening as we pick up the different gospel accounts of Judas Iscariot. John 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, Jesus, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus, which, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. Imagine that. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always." Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of this scripture tonight and others that we'll turn to this evening as we study the life of the one who betrayed the Lord Jesus, Judas Iscariot. And I pray, Lord, that you would open our understanding as we look at the different scriptures tonight. And Lord, help us to glean the truths that you would have us to glean that would challenge us and help us. And Lord, I pray that it would make us more effective servants for you. So Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit would be our guide now. And I pray that you'd help us to give careful attention to the only book you've ever written. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Judah, as we mentioned, or Judas, is always the twelfth on the list of the disciples. His name Judas, or Judah, means praise. He was the fourth. If you remember, Judah was the fourth son of Jacob. If you remember the, when the kingdom split and when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, the southern kingdom was called Judah and the northern kingdom was called Israel. All right? And so he, I think that just speaks that his parents had some high hopes for him. Uh, they wanted him to be able to praise the Lord and, and to praise God for him. The Iscariot is, just refers to a geographical area to where he was from. It was an area called Kerioth. In Judea. And so Judas, the man from Kerioth. Now that would just distinguish him because all the other disciples were from Galilee. And, and so he would be one that was not from Galilee. I think that may be uh, he, why they gave him the, the job being the treasurer. Because uh, most of those other guys knew each other. And, and they probably didn't trust each other. And uh, so they thought, well, we'll give it to this guy. Uh, we don't know him and he doesn't know us and we'll, we'll trust him with the money. Uh, maybe, maybe so, I don't know. Um, but more is said about Judas Iscariot than any of the other disciples except for Peter. It's interesting. But let's study a little bit about Judas tonight, all right? Number one <clears throat> is his criticism. And that's what we read tonight in John chapter 12, is his criticism. Six days before Jesus will not only celebrate the final Passover, but he'll be the Passover. He'll be the Passover lamb six days before he'll be betrayed and tried and condemned and go to the cross. He's invited to a supper in Bethany. Bethany is the town of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But this supper is not in their home. It's in the home of one who's called Simon a leper. And he, he invites these people into his home for a supper. Now, 
Obviously, if Simon was still a leper, he couldn't have people into his home, okay? Nor would you want to go to his home if he were, you were invited, all right? So obviously, I think this probably was a celebration dinner of his healing. Uh, probably a man whom the Lord had healed of his leprosy, and so he's inviting everyone in. But he also invited Lazarus, so it might have been a dual celebration. might have been a celebration not only of him being cured of leprosy, but also Lazarus being raised from the dead. He makes special note that Lazarus was there. And I imagine that would get a crowd. Uh, come see the guy who was dead and now he's alive again, okay? And uh, everybody wanted to get a glimpse of him. Well, while they're, and, and you understand there, they don't sit at a table or sit at tables like we do. Uh, when we eat, they, they had very low tables and they recline kind of on an elbow and they, they eat that way uh, in the Middle East. And so they're, as they're reclining and they're eating there, Mary comes in, the, the sister of Martha, and she takes an alabaster box of some very expensive ointment, it's perfume, and she pours it on the feet of Jesus. And then she begins to wipe his feet with her hair. And I want you to notice, she didn't just put a dab on. Now, most, most uh, women, I think, when they have perfume, you don't, you don't pour it on, Okay? Uh, if you do, somebody's liable to let you know that you poured it on, all right? But, but, you know, a little dab here or there, and that seems to be sufficient because it can be pretty potent stuff. Well, she didn't dab it. She poured it, and it filled the whole place with the fragrance. And her heart was overflowing with gratitude and love for what Jesus, I think, had done for her brother and probably what he'd done for her. Mary knew that Christ was the Son of God. And, and, you know, this, this perfume, they say, it, it, Judas valued it at 300 pence. If that's accurate, that's, that's, that's about an average year's wage. Think about what you make in a year's time. And a, a bottle of perfume costing that much money. And she poured it out on Jesus. And spent it on Him. Now, Matthew and Mark tells us, here, John talks that Judas speaks up, but Matthew and Mark, the same account, tell us that other people were upset too. They didn't speak up like Judas ended up, but they did say, why this waste? Why was this waste here made? And Judas is the one that says, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? Why are, you, why are you wasting it here? You know, this could have been given to poor people. And boy, you think, oh, he cares about poor people. Well, the great thing about the Bible is you keep reading the Bible and it'll give you some commentary, okay? And the Lord tells us in the next verse what Judas really meant, all right? And he said, this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the bag and bear what was put therein. So he wasn't, he wasn't, motivated by caring for the poor, or a love for the poor. He was motivated by greed. <laughs> he, he wanted the money in the treasury because he held the treasury. He wanted it in the purse because he pulled the purse strings. Okay, And so he wanted it. Now notice how quick Jesus was to rebuke him. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she done this. For the poor always you have with you, but... Me ye have not always. Jesus knew the love and devotion that Mary had, and He knew the selfishness and deceit of Judas. In less than a week, He, would, he Himself would become the Passover Lamb. The Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. Mary knew and believed that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And that He would give His life for her on the cross. And she was identifying Him and identifying with that by anointing His feet with that perfume. But I want you to notice, Jesus does not accept the criticism of His servants. All unkindness towards God's servants is condemned by God. Don't get in the habit of criticizing God's people. You're in a bad crowd when, that, when you get in that situation. 
You're in bad company. You're, you're, in, you're in the company of Satan. You're in the company of Judas. Not the crowd you want to be a part of. It's what Christ says about our conduct that matters. Not anybody else. Another thing to notice here is, listen, if Mary had anointed the Lord here, she wouldn't have had another opportunity. In other words, uh, she wouldn't have been able to do so. This was her opportunity to anoint Jesus because He was on His way to the cross. In six days, He'll be arrested and taken. And that's why Jesus said in verse 8, the poor always you have with you. Boy, I wish we could get the government to believe that. Let's wipe out poverty. You'll never do it. God says the poor you'll always have with you. You're not going to eradicate poverty. It won't happen. But what He's saying is, Mary will always have opportunity to help the poor. But she won't have always opportunity to do this for me. You understand? This is her time. This was her opportunity. And so, you, you can help the poor any time, but I won't be with you much longer. And that, that reminds us, folks, listen, giving to Christ comes before giving to social programs. You have to understand that um, the alabaster box goes to church before it goes to charity. That's the important principle that God establishes here. Nothing wrong with, with uh, charities or giving to charities, but the truth is, you, you have to make sure your devotion is to God first. It always goes to Him first, and He deserves the best. What a contrast there is here between the, the heart and the devotion of Mary and the selfishness and the deceit of Judas. What a contrast between the two characters here. And I also want to, I think there's another message to get from this, and that is this. Remember that any time you make a sacrificial act of giving to Christ, you will be criticized. Any time you pour it out and you really go above and beyond what somebody thinks you need to or you should, you're going to face some criticism. Mary did. Not just of Judas. Others there were feeling the same way. Others there were indignant that she did such a thing. And a lot of times, you know, you know why that is? Because it makes them look bad. She gave all this and she gave so devotedly and she weeps and wipes a, a, her, his feet with a hair and her tears. They didn't do anything like that. And it makes them look bad. No one in that room showed any more love or devotion to Christ than Mary did. But nobody was criticized in the room more than Mary was. So be prepared. When you decide to show devotion to Christ, you'll be criticized for, for being in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You'll, you'll have people criticize you. You don't have to do that. You'll be criticized for uh, maybe reading your Bible every day or telling someone about Jesus or passing out a gospel tract. People say, man, what kind of fanatic are you? What's happened to you, man? What's going on? And, and there's criticism that will come. You have to be prepared for that. It, it's not new. It's all the way back in Jesus' day. It, it hasn't changed. The worldly or the carnal Christian never applaud great deeds done for Christ. The world or the carnal Christian will never applaud great deeds done for Jesus Christ. If you faithfully serve God, don't be, don't be surprised when your service is mocked at or criticized. So, well, how do, you, how do you keep going? You keep going because you want to hear the commendation from the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And you can just hear when the criticism comes, don't you answer the critics. Don't take time out of doing... Like Nehemiah said when they wanted to criticize Wally, he said, come on down and talk to us. And Nehemiah said, I'm doing a great work. I don't have time to come down and talk to you guys. You just want to be critical. He said, he just kept on working. Just keep on working because the Lord Jesus said, let him alone. Let her alone. She's done this for me. 
So that's the criticism that Judas had of Mary's devotion for Christ. Now secondly, let's look at his crime. This is what most of he is known for. His crime, and that's the betrayal of Jesus. Now, this is of course carried in all four Gospels, and we're going to look at John 13, and we'll look at some other Gospels as well, but if you turn over one page to John 13, if you notice, um, when you put, and, and by the way, like most of these things, the crucifixion and this betrayal, you have to, uh, put all four accounts of the Gospels together to get the full detail and the full picture of what actually took place. Each of them add a different viewpoint and a different detail that maybe someone else didn't give us and we put it all together and they all fit together beautifully to give us the complete picture of what takes place. And so the first thing I want you to notice about his crime in betraying Jesus is it was predicted by Jesus. It was predicted by Jesus. John 13, and look with me starting at verse, I'm sorry, yeah, verse number 18. I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He. Jesus, how is predicted that Judas would betray Him. He actually has stated it twice. He did it once earlier in the ministry and then He does it the second time here at the Last Supper in the upper room. He's, he's already, folks, He's already earlier in chapter 13 given them that lesson in humility where they came into the room, remember, and the basin sits there and the water sits there and the towel sits there and no servant is there to wash anybody's feet. And the disciples are there waiting on Jesus, but nobody gets up and takes the role of a servant and begins to wash each other's feet. The disciples aren't going to do that to one another. Nobody wants to stoop that low and be a servant. So Jesus comes in the room and He sits down and He sees no one has done that, so He gets up and takes off His coat and puts the towel around Himself and he begins to wash the feet of his disciples, showing them his humility, and showing them that the greatest of all is the servant to all. And so he's taught them that lesson earlier. And yet he says in verse number 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. That was a shocking statement for the disciples to hear. They, they, they were in disbelief. You notice what he said? Verse 22, the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spake. In, in Matthew, they begin to question each other. And you remember in Matthew, it says they, they looked at the Lord and said, Is it I? Is it I? And they went all the way around, including Judas, and asked, Is it I? I mean, he, he chimed right in with all the rest. He was putting on a good show. He wasn't going to tip his hand yet. And Jesus said, it's the one who dips his hand with me in the dish. He's the one who's going to betray me. And that, and that makes it even worse. I mean, you, you talk about one of the one of the normal things and hospitable things in the Middle East is that you always have a meal. Uh, you, don't, you don't invite somebody to your home without feeding them. You, you come in and I mean, you, you feed them well. You have a pretty good spread. And boy, to, to put your hand in their hospitality, in their food, and break bread with them with the intent to betray them is as low as you can go. That's despicable. That was un, unthought of, unheard of. You just didn't do things like that. It would just be unthinkable. But maybe Jesus was stating this. Maybe He was trying to get Judas to repent. Maybe He's trying to get Judas to see that He knew and so, 
At least, at least Judas knew this. He knew now that Jesus knew. He knew that he knew, but he didn't know if Jesus knew, but now he knows that Jesus knows. You got all that? The disciples were very slow to get this. It says in verse 26, Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. Some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So they, they still didn't get it. They still didn't think Judas had anything to do with the betrayal. Because they, 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 they really, and by the way, that's, I think, by the way, to their credit, they, they weren't thinking evil of any man. They, weren't, they were not going to think the worst of any of them, and even Judas. They wanted to think the best. And that's, that's a good thing. They all, their question wasn't, when Jesus said one of you is going to betray me, they didn't look around the table and say, yeah, I, got, I got some good ideas. Yeah, I got my own a couple guys. I, I, I think I got it pegged. I got it narrowed down to a few of the suspects. No, no. They all said, is it me? Is it me? They, they were looking at themselves. And that's a, that's a mighty good thing to do. And, and don't, don't look at everybody else. Because all, they all had dipped in the bowl with Jesus. They all had partaken the meal with the Lord Jesus. And they didn't want to be the one that would be betraying Him. So Jesus predicted it. But not only that, secondly, be there on your paper, I think, it was prophesied by the Scripture. When Jesus said someone's going to betray me, he said in verse 18 that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now let's look at some Old Testament scriptures, okay? Put your finger or put a card there in John 13. We'll come back to it. Uh, go to Psalm 41. Will you look there? Pick up, in fact, pick up Psalm 41 and Psalm 109, since it's both in the book of Psalms. Psalm 41 and then Psalm 109. We are roughly, when you read these psalms, somewhere around a thousand years before these, this event with Judas and Jesus take place. Let's see what the Scripture says. Notice Psalm 41, verse 9. The Bible says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. That's the reference that Jesus used in John 13. He's lifted up his heel against me. Now look at Psalm 109. And verse number 5. The Bible says, And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. That became a prophecy for Judas. Back in Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah is the next to the last book of the Old Testament. If you get all the way to Malachi, just take a left and come back a book, and you'll hit Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 11. Notice with me verses 12 and 13, where the Bible says here, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price. What they weigh, church? 30 pieces of silver. We'll say more about that in just a few moments. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was priced at them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. The prediction there that Christ would be betrayed for 30 pieces 
of silver. Now Jesus said over in John 13, if you go back there, Jesus said in John 13 verse 19, now I tell you before it come, but I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He. He says, I'm telling you this so that you'll believe that I'm the Christ. It's another opportunity for Christ to prove His deity to His disciples by predicting His betrayal. But it's not just predicted by Jesus, it was prophesied by the Word of God. So you understand, it would strengthen their faith in the living Word, which is Jesus, but it would also strengthen their faith in the written Word of God. That it too is reliable and trustworthy. For it long ago told of His betrayal at the hands of Judas. So we see that it was predicted by Christ and it was prophesied by the Scriptures. Then I want you to notice, see, it was painful to Jesus Christ. <coughs> it was painful to Jesus Christ. Notice John 13 and verse 21. When Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray Me. Troubled in spirit. He was, he was hurt. Did you know our sin hurts God? All sin, if you remember in our lesson on forgiveness, all sin is against God. When Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I can't sin against God and do this. When David in his psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, he prayed and he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great wickedness. We hurt God when we sin. And we hurt Him in many ways. We hurt His honor. We hurt His heart. We hurt His name. And you may not, at first when you're growing up or maybe you're a young Christian and, and you do things wrong, you think, you think, well, God's mad at me. Well, you don't understand. I guess, I guess you become, uh, how many parents in the room tonight? Parents, parents okay? Almost, almost everybody. When your children do something wrong, you know what? The overriding emotion is not anger. It's hurt. Disappointment. I told you when, when I got to be of age, uh, got to be a junior, a senior in high school, and, and, and you know, where I really didn't fear uh, the, the, the getting a spanking. You know? In fact, I feared getting grounded a couple weeks worse than I did a spanking because I'd rather be out. You know? But you know what, what I feared more than anything else is when my dad looked at me when I had done something wrong. And he said, I'm really disappointed in you. Wow. That pierced in me. And, and I knew that I never wanted to feel that way again. But you understand, that's where you want to go to in your Christian life. Where, well, I better do this or God will take me to the woodshed. I better do this or God will club me in the head. Huh? you got... You really got the wrong idea about God. You ought to grow in your relationship to where you understand we're here. Remember, we're here. We're created to bring Him pleasure. We're here to please Him. When we don't do that, He's not mad. He's not angry. But He is hurt. He's disappointed. He's, he's, he's disappointed us. And, and all sin hurts God. That's my business what I do. No, it isn't. It's God's business what you do. You're, you're his child. No, no child would look at their parent and say, not your business what I do, it's my business. <laughs> no, it's my business, you're my child. And we're God's children. And so it's important that we honor him and live for his glory. So all sin is painful to Christ. So this was painful to Christ, to suffer the betrayal. D is it was planned by Judas. 
It was planned by Judas. For this, I want you to go to Matthew 26. Go to Matthew's account, all right? It's found in Matthew chapter 26. Are you doing all right? Are you okay? All right. It says, I know this isn't the most, you know, thrilling guy to study, but we, we need to learn about him, all right? Matthew 26. I feel like after I spent most of yesterday preparing this thing on Judas, I felt like going and taking a shower and washing my hands and saying, man, I don't want to be around this guy anymore, you know? But here we are, all right? So Matthew 26. Same account here. If you notice that she... And uh, verse 10, Jesus rebukes him when he says, Why trouble ye the woman? She wrought a good work upon me. For the poor always, for you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that is she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. And then he makes the promise that wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for memorial of her. Then, did you notice that? Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests. Then. What, when's then? Well, then is right after he was rebuked by Jesus in front of that crowd for criticizing Mary for her act of devotion and love for Christ. Then he goes out and starts looking for the chief priests and wants an opportunity to betray Jesus Christ and begins to plan the betrayal of the Lord Jesus. When a good person is rebuked, he repents. When a bad person is rebuked, he gets mad and plans revenge. Did you notice Judas wasn't contacted by the religious leaders? He contacted them. He went to them. Luke, go to Luke's account, Luke chapter 22. Would you flip over there real quick for me? Luke 22 is where Luke picks up this account. And it says in verse number 3 of Luke 22, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, because uh, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. The betrayal was satanic. Jesus was right, and we'll look at it later at the end of the lesson in John chapter 6, when He said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He was right on target. Judas was in agreement with hell in the betraying of Jesus Christ. Back in the book of Matthew, He said, What will you give me? And it says they agreed upon 30 pieces of silver. Can I say Judas sold out pretty cheap? You go back to the book of Exodus 21 and you find that if a man had a servant and he got gored or run over by an ox or by an animal of some kind that you another guy owned and you had to replace that servant, you know what you replaced him with? 30 pieces of silver. It was the price of a slave. That's all it was. But that 30 pieces of silver, why? You say, boy, that's cheap. Why did he settle on that? Do you remember Zechariah 11? The Scripture had already prophesied it would be for 30 pieces of silver. If, if they'd have known the Old Testament at all, I think he'd have said, wait a minute, let's not make it 30. But it's amazing to me, even people today who, who should know the Bible are, are fulfilling Bible prophecy and they don't even realize it. So he sought opportunity to betray him. He planned it out. Planned it out. And by the way, listen, 
sin is that way. We, we, use that, we use that term sometimes, somebody fell into sin. But that's usually not true. The Bible says when, when um, in James 1, how we're, we're uh, lured off the path. How Satan tries to lure us uh, off the path of, with temptation. It said when sin, when it's conceived... We know the conception in the, in the terms of having a child. But there, the, the word used there for conceived is, is uh, what Brother Currington has taught us in RU. It, it's a word that means framed in your mind. You begin to frame in your mind how you can carry out what you're about to do. And once you begin to frame it in your mind, you're going to do it. And, and, and Because once it's conceived, it brings forth death. Once sin is conceived, it brings forth death. Lust brings forth sin, and sin brings forth death. LSD. So he sought opportunity to betray him. He begins to frame in his mind how he can make it happen. And he's going to make it happen. E is it was performed at night. It was performed at night. Jesus takes the disciples. Uh, Go to John 18 with me, will you please? John chapter 18. Jesus goes at night to the Garden of Gethsemane. John 18 and verse number 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, He went forth with His disciples over the brook Kidron, and where was a garden into the which He entered and His disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed Him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. He knew. Judas thought he was pretty smart, I'm sure, because he figured, I know where he's going to go. I've seen him go there often when, he, when, he had, when he's facing something big, and I, I, I think I know where he's headed. And he probably thought he was pretty smart, but what Judas didn't realize, he thought he was smart because he knew where Jesus was, but what he didn't realize is Jesus knew exactly where he was. He didn't realize that. And here they come. Verse 3. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, <clears throat> knowing all things that should come, unto, come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. And as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I don't know about you. That would have been enough for me right there to say, I think I'm leaving. You you see just a glimpse of the power when he says, I am. That's the name that God told Moses to tell him when, who am I going to tell Pharaoh sent me? You tell him I am sent them unto you. And now Jesus says, who are you? I am He. And boy, they, they fell backwards. They were knocked to the ground. Much like Saul was on the road to Damascus. They answered. Well, as soon as He said to them, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked He them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. If therefore ye seek Me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which ye spake of them which thou gavest Me. Have I lost none? And i got news for you. He still hasn't lost any. Okay? Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up the sword, thy sword into the sheath, the cup with my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? The band of the captains and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father in law to Caiaphas, which was a high priest that same year. And we'll stop right there for now. Notice Jesus meets them. Did you did you pick that up in verse four? Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They didn't come. He wasn't hiding behind a tree somewhere. 
He wasn't kneeling behind the bushes, you know, make it tough for him to find me. He went marching right up to them and said, who are you looking for, fellas? He met them. Don't, don't listen to any of this uh, modern stuff or Hollywood stuff that tells you Jesus didn't know what was going on and uh, He didn't realize that they were going to kill Him and he, he, didn't, he, he was all mixed up. Jesus knew exactly what was going on at all times. And notice where Judas was standing. It says, Judas stood with them in verse 5, the enemies of Christ. Oh, for, for all of Christ's ministry, since He chose His disciples, He was always standing with Jesus. He would always be standing with the twelve. Now He's on the other side. Standing with the enemies of Christ. And as Christ speaks, they're all knocked to the ground. I would suppose Judas would be among them. But it also shows us that no one took Jesus' life. He laid it down Himself. And then, of course, the sign that Jesus gave was, and that's in another account in the other Gospels, how would He show them that this was really Jesus? He would go up and give them a what? Give them a kiss. The token of friendship of a kiss, and He used it as a sign of betrayal. Well, let's look, number three, at the consequences of His crime. The consequences of His crime. Go back to Matthew 27 now, will you? We'll be wrapping it up here soon. Matthew 27. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put Him to death. <coughs> Excuse me. And when they had bound Him, they led Him away and delivered Him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed Him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it's the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought, bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. It was fulfilled, verse 9, again the scripture was fulfilled by Jeremy the prophet, Jeremiah. And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him it was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord had appointed me. Here's the consequences of Judas's crime. He paid for it with his life. It cost him his life. So, well, didn't he repent? No, it says he repented himself. What, 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 the first thing that came to my mind when I read that and he repented himself was, when the Pharisee and the publican went up to pray. And the Pharisee prayed thus with himself. He didn't pray to God. He prayed with himself. And that's how he prayed. I thank thee. Remember his prayer? I thank that I'm not like other men are. I don't do this. I don't do this. I fast. I tithe. I do this. He, he wasn't talking to God at all. He's just bragging on himself. So he was repenting to himself. He was sorry that he had done it himself he was he didn't want to carry the guilt of wrongdoing you see he did that when he saw jesus was condemned maybe he didn't think that it would happen maybe he thought that jesus they would say i find no fault in him and they figure they got they got that other guy barabbas he's a murderer they're not gonna let jesus go for the murderer i, I i'll they'll let him go he'll still be good I'll have 30 pieces of silver and I'm on my way. But when he saw that wasn't going to happen, he felt guilty about it and he didn't want to carry the guilt. When he saw the righteous one declared unrighteous. When he saw the just declared to be unjust. When he saw the sinless one called the sinful one. He couldn't bear the burden of guilt. 
And he bought those 30 pieces of silver back and he threw them down in the temple. Because they wouldn't take them back. And then he went out and hanged himself. Now the truth is, Acts 1 and verse 18 tells us a little more details. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it for you. Acts 1 and verse 18, it says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Now listen, And falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Judas, Judas even botched up his own suicide. I mean, whether, whether he slung himself over a tree limb and the limb broke and he fell down on some rocks or something and everything exploded. and I mean, his, his, his gut split and his bowels all came out. Aren't you glad you're at church tonight? Huh? I mean, he was a mess. An absolute mess. But I want to remind you, that's how sin always ends up. It'll always end up a bigger mess than you ever thought it would be. One of the great deceitfulness of things of sin and how deceitful it is, is we think we can control the consequences of our sin. And you cannot. I want to remind you that Judas left all and followed Jesus just like the other eleven did. There were, there were no characteristics or qualities that made him stand out from anybody else, either positive or negative. Remember at the Last Supper there when Jesus said, one of you going to betray me, none of them said, well, sure, Judas. We got him pegged. Not at all. They were stunned. They didn't want to believe it and they didn't believe it. He conversed with Jesus. He heard Jesus teach. He saw amazing miracles. Now look at John chapter 6 and we'll close. Okay, John chapter 6. We're almost done. Thanks for staying with me. John 6. and John 6 is a long chapter. 71 verses and Jesus is laying out as people begin to follow him and he gets a crowd, he's going to whittle the crowd down a little bit. Okay? It's funny, in our day and age, everybody wants a big crowd. Jesus never wanted a big crowd. He seemed to always uh, whittle it down when it got to be too big. He gave the old, uh, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't be my follower speech, you know? And uh, I, I can just, I, I just smile when I see that because I can think the disciple think, oh no, not that again. They, people, don't, people don't take that well, Jesus. Don't, don't talk like that. They don't get it. And, and sure enough, they didn't. And you understand, Jesus wasn't talking literally. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But you notice, in verse 65, Then He said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto Me except that were given him of My Father. And from that time many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him. Many of His disciples turned away and said, we're done. Now, not the twelve. They're still there. But many of these others who had been following Him, they turned and they left. And so Jesus looks at these twelve guys and He asks them the question. Verse 67, Jesus said unto the twelve, will ye also go away? Those times, okay, fellas, here's your chance. Everybody else is leaving. You're going to leave too? And Jesus, or Peter makes the great statement. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that Thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Peter speaks for him, but you know what the mistake Peter made? He spoke for the whole group. He had, Judas had gained the confidence of the other eleven. And so when Peter said, hey, we all believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you have the words of eternal life, he put Judas right in there with him. 
And Jesus has to let him know, Peter, you've made a mistake. Not all of you believe. Notice what he said. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Devil. The word is diabolos, which means slanderer, accuser. The other eleven had no idea that Judas wasn't a believer just like them. Because, because outwardly he did everything right. He carried his Bible to church. He looked good. He knew when to say amen. He could sing the songs without the whole song book. He had everybody fooled. And by the way, because man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on our heart. Judas kept company with Jesus for his entire ministry. But he separated from Jesus for all eternity. What a tragedy. Now don't think, I don't think for a minute that we can, and, and would you agree that if Jesus had twelve and one of them wasn't a true believer but acted like one, do you think with more than 12 in our congregation that there'd be somebody or somebodies that is just going along with it all but don't really believe? Don't truly know Christ as their Savior? That's how it was with Judas. Oh, everybody thinks I'm saved. Everybody thinks I'm a follower of Jesus. But you know in your heart and the Spirit of God convicts your heart that you're really not saved. My friend, don't risk missing eternity with Christ. Don't miss going to hell for eternity just because you think, why didn't want anybody to think I wasn't saved? Don't be like Judas. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let everybody think you're saved. And then you, the, the rapture comes and everybody's gone and you look around and say, I'm still here. Or don't let a pain come through your chest or a car come through the intersection and you go out into eternity and you wake up in the flames of hell. Don't let that happen. Make sure you know Christ as your Savior. Make sure you know that you have eternal life. Make sure that you know Him. That you've believed on Him with your heart. Don't be a Judas Iscariot. Let's stand together for prayer, okay? Father, we bow before You now this evening. Lord, it's a sobering study to study the life of Judas Iscariot. I understand why it tr you were troubled in spirit. It hurt you to see this one whom you ate with and taught with and walked with and ministered with for your earthly ministry to see Him turn. And yet, Lord, You know in this congregation who the true followers are and who the Judases are. We don't know. Just like the disciples didn't know. But Lord, I pray that You'd minister to hearts tonight. And if there's any tonight that are just been going along with the going with the flow, going along with the program, because these are nice people. And I, I like, I like uh, nice people and nice songs, and this is a, a, a good church, and but Lord, they need to know you. 
Don't let them be a Judas and go be separated from you forever in hell.